Hi everyone, welcome back. Sorry I missed last week. My grandmother has some medical issues and hospital visits and all that fun stuff and so kind of just didn't have the time or energy to put out a video last week. But I am back and if I sound a bit off, my left ear, I'm doing some cleaning solution stuff in my left ear and I can't hear anything out of my left ear, like nothing. So if I sound a bit off or I literally sound like I'm screaming is because I can't hear out of one ear. This is not going to be a chaotic video. It's going to be a fun one because we start out with political assassinations coming back hard right here. <laughs> they are seen as bad and as good, honestly, due to the person that is killed. Possibly the most famous political assassinations are that of Abraham Lincoln and JFK. Those are seen as a bad and devastating political assassination versus, say, if Hitler or Stalin was assassinated, I would assume the world would set off fireworks, like the 4th of freaking July for the world. Those are just a few examples, but there have been many political assassinations throughout history. Some seen for the greater good, some seen as a massive loss for the future, some were daring assassinations, and others were pure interesting. Charlotte Corday did a very interesting political assassination. Let's get started. <laughs> yeah, this one's gonna be fun. Mary Ann Charlotte Corday de Mont was born on July 27, 1768 in Normandy, France. Specifically, she was born in the Ronsway Farm or Ligdery's Farm House. She was a member of a fallen aristocratic family and a fifth generation descendant to Pierre Corneli, who was a playwright. Charlotte was the fourth of five children to father Jacques-Francois de Corday de Mure, who was the youngest son of the aristocratic family. And her mother was a destitute noblewoman named Charlotte Mary Gaultier de Zizieux. I think that's how I say it. They were cousins. Love that 1700 France logic. Tragedy struck the family when her mother and eldest sister both passed away in April of 1782. Completely devastated, Jacques was unable to support his children. So he sent Charlotte and her younger sister Eleanor to Abbaye de Dame, or Ladies Abbey, a convent in Cannes, about 40 miles from her home. At first, Charlotte was a little shy and awkward, but she eventually grew into an elegance that would make her noble family proud. She got an amazing education given by the nuns who taught her to be refined and well-mannered. She was noted for her talents in singing and drawing, and her beauty was striking. Described just above five feet tall, with a slender build, soft gray eyes, dimpled cheeks, I had dimpled cheeks, they're fun to have, an oval face, and a high forehead, which I think just means her forehead is big. But interestingly, she was said to have light brown and curling hair, but this would be disputed in a famous painting of her that I will talk about later that shows her as blonde haired. This fact that I found about her, I relate to her so much. While at the convent and described as naturally intelligent and a bookworm, she could often be found in the convent library consumed in Greek and Roman histories. And the ideas of the Roman Republic would highly influence her. Remember this part. As Charlotte matured, she became more aware of the heightened political tensions in France, and this got her interested in reading books by Enlightenment philosophers, becoming popular in France like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Voltaire. From these works, she became interested in their ideas like natural rights, separation of powers, and social contract, which was the philosophy about the legitimacy of the authority of state over the people. The U.S. Constitution is a great example of this. By the beginning of 1789, tensions in France were reaching a boiling point. The unfair taxes on the poor and the stupid level of extravagance of the aristocrats were leading to the people of France, also known as the Third Estate, aka known as the poor people, aka the really poor people, were becoming a little bit pissed off. <laughs> and those pissed offness led to not 
completely peaceful protests like the storming of the Bastille in Paris on July 14, 1789, and the Women's March on Versailles on October 5, 1789. The Women's March on Versailles was the earliest and most significant event of the French Revolution that began in a marketplace where women, and that's the most notable part about this, women were rioting over the extremely high price of bread. And I couldn't find exactly what the price was, but what I could find and what I could decipher is, you think that bread is expensive now? They would kill to, actually I shouldn't say that they would kill to have less expensive bread because they kind of did. This march was significant because, like I said, a group of women were successfully able to force King Louis XVI and the royals to return to Paris to begin to face the insanity of everything. Despite Charlotte's aristocratic background, at first she supported the earlier revolution. She was in favor of the 1789 Declaration of Man and Citizen and the August Decrees. Both were acts that would aid the lower class. Of course, this support put her into a bit of a gray area with her royal and aristocratic family because they, of course, supported the king. In fact, both of her brothers were going to leave France to join the Royalist French Immigrant Army, and on the night they were going to leave, the family did a farewell dinner, like you would for anybody going off to college, for them, and it included a toast to King Louis the Sixteenth. While everyone else stood up to toast, Charlotte stayed seated. Drama! When her father asked her why she didn't toast, she said, quote, I believe he is vitreous, but a weak king cannot be a good king. He is powerless to prevent the misfortunes of his people, end quote. She was later asked outright if she was a Republican. She answered with, quote, I should be if the French were worthy of a republic, end quote. Burn. By the time her brothers left, Charlotte had every right to have her views begin to change. I mean, you know, by this time, the revolution was starting to get a little bit crazy with the, you know, burnings, a whole lot of killing, displacements, heads on spikes. It was getting a little bit crazy. I mean, my views would change too if I were seeing heads on spikes as the new trend. However, the biggest thing that started to change Charlotte's mind about which side to be on was when on July 12th, 1790, the civil constitution of the clergy was passed. This was a decree the National Assembly passed in an attempt to have complete control over the Catholic Church in France. This in turn forced the closure of all monasteries and convents. And if you remember at this time, Charlotte lives in a convent. One that she had been calling home for the past eight years. She went there when she was 13 years old and she's just told to go. I'd be a little bit upset too. Forced out of her home, Charlotte went to live with her cousin, Madame de Bretville, who was in Cannes, refusing to live with her father. Now they had differing political views, but despite that, they were able to form a close relationship. Her cousin would even name Charlotte her sole Error. Alrighty, revolution talk time. While living with her cousin in Cannes, the revolution was getting worse and worse, but mainly more and more divisive. By September 1792, the French Revolutionary Wars were well underway. By this point, the French monarchy had been overthrown and the first French Republic was created. With all these swift movements and changes, a bitter rivalry between the Jacobian and Girondin factions began. The Girondins were a political group that were active from 1791 to 1793. They were a moderate group that favored a constitutional government and was mainly made up of the middle class of France, like merchants and lawyers. The Jacobins, also known as the Moltenyads, were the most influential political group during the French Revolution, and their goal was to oust King Louis XVI and establish a French Republic that came from the people. By this point, the Girondins had dominated since 1791, but were now taking a more moderate stance against radical populism that were encouraged 
by the Jacobins. The Girondins were worried that a little too much of the revolution's fate was being dictated by French mobs at the expense of everyone else and was wanting the revolution to be reined in a bit because, you know, the heads on spikes is a little bit on the worrying side. The Jacobins, on the other hand, were on the side of the lower classes and wanted to expand the revolution in more extreme directions. And this is where we meet this guy, Jean-Paul Marat. He was a politician and journalist during the revolution and was a vicious defender of the Jean Culottes or without breeches. This was their name because they wanted to separate themselves from the aristocrats because they wore breeches. These pants. Breeches, you got it? Because they're rich and they can afford breeches and breeches are expensive. And so if you don't wear the breeches, you, you get it. You got it. You got it. Okay, cool. You got it. We're moving on. Jean was a radical voice and published his views in ads, newspapers, and pamphlets. And he wrote a lot of these thoughts where all great thoughts come from. In his bathtub. Hold on. Hold on. Between 1789 and 1792, Jean was often made to hide, sometimes in the Paris sewers, yay, and it is here that it is believed after a 200-year-old DNA test, science, bitch, that he developed a skin disease that left his skin blistered and very itchy. Hi, Maxie. My dog just came in. What is this science word? We now know that he had seborrheic dermatitis, super infected by, let me see if I can say these correctly, Staphylococcus aureus and QT bacterium actus. Yep. Staphylococcus is a bacteria that is spread by contaminated hands, and though most infections are not serious, it can cause serious infections in the bloodstream, bones, and joints, and even pneumonia. QT bacterium is also a bacteria, specifically a bacteria in the skin family and is linked to acne. This is spread through skin contact and can be maintained by regular cleaning. However, if this comes into contact with super infected skin, with no washing, maybe because, you know, you've been hiding in a sewer from really bad people and you haven't gotten the chance to bathe and change your clothes. You kind of just stayed in them because you were fighting a revolutionary war. You know, those kinds of things. This bacteria can get nasty. And Jean here, hiding in the Paris sewers, had already contracted seborrheic dermatitis, which is an overgrowth of Malassezia yeast, which is a common type of fungi in the skin and affects the oily areas of the body, like face, eyebrows, ears, chest, sides of nose, eyelids, but mainly affects your scalp. This causes patches in the hair, a hella amount of dandruff, and infected skin. Excuse me while I go wash my hands. So yeah, Jean had those diseases and to alleviate the uncomfortableness of his skin, he spent hours in a medical bath of some type of medical solution, but we have no idea what chemicals were used. And crazy fact, his original bathtub can be seen in the Grévon Museum Wax Museum in Paris, where a certain scene plays out and we'll get into that. But anyway, Jean is a huge player in Charlotte's story. Now that I have made you very uncomfortable with the hands and diseases, Let's move on. Like many others in France, Charlotte was on the side of the Girondins and was sickened by the violent mobs that were being encouraged by the Jacobins. Like, for example, the September massacres in 1792, where between 1,100 and 1,600 people were killed by the sans-culottes. So naturally, she was not happy with where the Jacobins were leading France. She called this massacre unnecessarily cruel and violent. Their political views also affected her personally. They executed Abbé Gumbu, who was the priest who gave Charlotte's mother her last rites. He was killed on April 5th, 1793 with the guillotine. Plus, he was the first to be executed this way in Cannes. 
After his death, Khan fell into disarray, especially after the Girondins were forced out of the National Convention by most totally Jacobins. And I say that because there's no official evidence of the fact, but I'm just saying most totally Jacobin mobs. So Khan became a type of a safe haven for Girondins on the run. When runaway Girondins had meetings, Charlotte likely would have attended them and admired their speeches. She respected the Girondins' political principles and aligned herself with their thinking. See, the Girondins had a more moderate approach to the revolution and like her, weren't happy with the direction France was taking. What really uneased her was when Khan had a military parade as a show of force against the Jacobins. This combined, she became convinced that the Jacobins were going to lead France down a bloody and dark path. And if they weren't stopped, she believed that the revolution would become irreversibly corrupt and thousands would die. All this led her to wanting to make an attempt to save France. And how was she going to do this? Easy, kill a Jacobin leader. Now she could have chosen anyone. She could have chosen Camille de Molins, George Danton, which before we move on, what a face. Louis Antoine de Saint-Just, also known as the Archangel of Terror, to even Maximilien Robespierre. You know him, he kind of went AWOL with his weird fetish with the guillotine chopping off all the heads till his head was chopped off that stopped all the heads getting chopped off. You know him. She could have chosen him. Which what a what if can of worms that thought process is. But nope, she chose Jean-Paul Marat. The reason she chose him was because she saw him as the sole threat to the Republic and she thought that killing him would be an act of service. By killing him, the violence and the death happening across France would stop. So on July 9th, 1793, Charlotte left her home with her cousin carrying the book Parallel Lives by Plutarch and walked to Paris over the course of about two to three days. But before she left, she wrote a letter to her father telling him that she was leaving for England and asked him to not forget her. We don't know why she told him England when she was really going to Paris. She got to Paris on July 11th and got a room at the Providence Hotel. She had three things to do while in Paris, settle affairs for her friend Alexandre de Forbin, get some help to enter the home of Jean and kill Jean. Easy. During her time there, she wrote a letter she titled, Address to the French, Friends of Law and Peace, where she explained her motive to kill Jean. Quote, Marat, whose name alone presents the image of all crime in falling under the avenging steel, shakes the mountain and makes Danton grow pale. Rose Pierre, those other brigands seated upon the bloody throne, are enveloped in the lightning which the avenging gods of humanity only suspend without doubt to render their fall more glittering and to affright all those who would be tempted to establish their fortunes on the ruins of an abused people." End quote. I don't know when, but she soon bought a six inch kitchen knife. Have no idea when she bought that, but she now has a knife. So that's a good thing to have. Initially, she planned to assassinate Jean at the Bastille Day Parade. This is a holiday held on July 14th, which celebrated the storming of the Bastille that ushered in the French Revolution. This would be the perfect spot because the entire national convention would be there. And this was because she wanted to make an example out of him. Kill him in front of everybody. That's an example you would certainly set. However, when she arrived in Paris, unbeknownst to her, she learned that he was no longer attending meetings. He had a skin condition that confined him to his home in his bathtub. It's not funny, but that's really funny. So, you know, she kind of had to pivot. <laughs> She'll now kill him in his home on the Rue des Corlières. Around 8 a.m. on July 13th, she made her first attempt at entering Jean's home. She claimed to have knowledge of an uprising in Caen that was planned by the Girondins, but Jean's sister-in-law turned her away. But she came back around 11.30, and this time, the sister of Jean's fiance, Simon, Catherine Evoy, turned her away. She turned her away because she had a weird feeling about Charlotte's desperation to see Jean. But 
third time's a charm. At 7 p.m., she went back to the house, and this time, Jean himself allowed her in against both girls' better judgment. Now, you might be thinking, I'm certain that Jean would at least get dressed to meet his guests despite his condition. It's cordial, right? Oh, no. He would take meetings and guests from his bathtub. Like, this guy's really freaking weird. This guy's really weird. He even shouted from his bathroom, let her in, to Simon, who greeted Charlotte this time around. Let her in. <laughs> Little did he know, he just let in death herself. When Charlotte entered his bathroom, I'm sorry. <laughs> When Charlotte entered his bathroom, she saw Jean soaking in his tub with a piece of wood laid across him that acted as his desk with a blanket covering his lower parts. Wow. For the next 15 minutes, Jean questioned Charlotte about these Girondin traders in Cannes. She provided names and Jean made his own Aya list. <laughs> If you've seen Game of Thrones, you know what that means. When she finished, Jean said, quote, good, in a few days, I'll have them all guillotined, end quote. With these words, Charlotte reached into her dress, pulled out her knife, and plunged it into his chest. Jean screamed for his fiance, but by the time she got to the bathroom, the bathwater had turned red and Jean was dead. This moment is immortalized in Jacques Louis David's single-angled painting called The Death of Marat in 1793. He is also known for arguably his most well-known painting, Napoleon at the St. Bernard Pass in 1801. You might know it as Napoleon Crossing the Alps. Another painting immortalizing the scene, but from a different angle, is by Paul Jacques Ami Baudry, simply named Charlotte Corday in 1860. And this painting is the scene in the Wax Museum in Paris with the original bathtub Marat was killed in. I love connecting dots. <laughs> This news spread like wildfire. Within hours, news of the assassination went all over France and politicians and the public were horrified. However, others saw it as a good thing. Apparently after she killed him, she just chilled and waited for the police to arrest her. <sighs> like, it's just, all right. When the police got there, a crowd of neighbors had basically citizens arrested her. And when the cops took her away, she didn't resist or try to escape. And really quickly, this painting that I saw of her getting arrested, can we talk about the guy with the freaking chair? Like, I, I don't know what he's planning on. What was the dude's plan? Or maybe that was the chair she was sitting in and he went, this chair is mine. I'm going to get a bunch of money for it one day. Charlotte was interrogated, answered all their questions, didn't deny the assassination because it was premeditated, and that she acted alone. When she was asked why, she simply said, quote, with this one dead, the others perhaps will be afraid, end quote, and hoped that her deed would discourage the Jacobins. At this point, officials didn't believe her, but she maintained that she planned and did it all herself. She was taken to the Abbey prison and spent the night on a straw mattress with her only companion being a black cat. At the time, the idea that a woman committed this was shocking. Women were seen as no more than second-class citizens or lower people in society, and she was challenging this. Feminism? I don't know. <laughs> While in prison, she wrote a letter to her father saying, quote, Forgive me, my dear papa, for having disposed of my existence without your permission. I have avenged many innocent victims. I have prevented many other disasters. The people one day disillusioned will rejoice in being delivered from a tyrant. If I tried to persuade you that I was passing through England, it was because I hoped to keep it incognito, but I recognize the impossibility. I hope you will not be tormented. In any case, I believe 
believe that you would have defenders in Khan. I took Gustav Dulcet as a defender. Such an attack allows no defense. It's for the form. Goodbye, my dear papa. Please forgive me, or rather rejoice in my fate. The cause is good. I kiss my sister, whom I love with all my heart, as well as all my parents. Do not forget this verse by Corneli. Crime is shame, not the scaffold. It is tomorrow at 8 o'clock that I am judged this 16 July, end quote. Charlotte had three separate cross-examinations where she stressed she was a Republican and was so before the revolution, citing the values of the ancient Romans. But the officials would not drop that she had to be a part of a bigger conspiracy. But she insisted that, quote, I alone conceived the plan and executed it, end quote. Her trial was short and was sentenced to death by guillotine on July 17th. As a final request, Charlotte asked the court for a portrait of her to be commissioned so she could be remembered. Quote, Since I still have a few moments to live, might I hope, citizens, that you will allow me to have myself painted. End quote. It was granted and Jean Paul Hauer, who was sympathetic to her, agreed to paint her. For the final two hours of her life, she sat for Howard in her cell, saying that the painting would become famous and would help cement her as a martyr. And to this day, this painting is the best known portrait of Charlotte and is the center of controversy as to either if her hair was brown or blonde. And we don't know why her hair is blonde in this picture, but she is described as having brown hair. Before the painting was finished, the executioner, Charles Henry Sanson, interrupted them to take Charlotte away. This is immortalized in Arturo's Michelina's 1889 painting, Charlotte Corday being conducted to her execution. As she got up to go, she cut a lock of her hair off and gave it to Howard as a token of her appreciation. Charlotte Corday died on July 17, 1793 by the guillotine at the age of 24. She died 10 days before her 25th birthday. Absolutely sickeningly and warning because this is a little bit graphic. After she was beheaded, the executioner's assistant grabbed her head and slapped her on the cheek. According to legend, her head then blushed after the slap. And morbidly, interestingly, because this is me, this has been long since used as evidence that a human head can retain consciousness for as much as 15 to 30 seconds after being decapitated. The more you know. Also sickingly, the Jacobins ordered an autopsy to see if she was a virgin because they were still not convinced that she acted alone. Because I mean, she had to have done this on the orders of a man, maybe a lover, because why should a woman have a mind of her own to take action for what she thought was wrong? Pfft. Obviously, she had to have a lover of a man, so she must not be a virgin. Which by the way, she was a virgin. <clears throat> Anyway, despite Charlotte's hopes, the assassination of Jean didn't do anything. In fact, it only escalated the extremism of the Jacobins, leading to the French Revolution's infamous reign of terror. Jean was turned into a martyr and was immortalized, being compared to Jesus, and his body was embalmed for all France to view. A statue of him even replaced the Virgin Mary on the Rue Act Ars, and he was named a quasi-saint. This makes the legacy of Charlotte a mixed one. On one hand, killing John made him a martyr, but on the other hand, she also became one because of it. Some saw her as a hero, others saw her as a traitor. It is even thought that her action is what led to an act that banned women's political clubs and even led to the guillotine of Girondin female activists, Madame Roland and Olam de Gouges. However, she did change the perception of women during the revolution on their personal power and acting on their beliefs. And because of this, many feminists don't condemn her and see her as a heroine. 
In the centuries after her death, she has been an inspiration for everything from paintings to songs to literature to even video games. In 1847, French statement, poet, and author Alfou de la Monti gave Charlotte the title of the Angel of Assassination, and she has been referred to this name ever since. Charlotte is briefly compared to a revolutionary hero in Victor Hugo's famous novel, Les Miserables, or The Miserables, or Les Mis, as Americans say it. Percy Shelley wrote about her in his 1810 collection of poetry called Posthumous Fragments of Margaret Nicholson. In 2014, a graphic novel series titled Order from Chaos is dedicated to both Charlotte and Jean, and she is a suspect in a murder in a mission in the video game Assassin's Creed unity. Whether it's in literature or video games, Charlotte Corday is certainly remembered. There you go, the full story of Charlotte Corday. All I knew about her is that she killed the dude in, in the bathtub that wrote a whole bunch of really weird, really bad things. And that was kind of it. I didn't know her full story. And even though her story ends tragically. It's so much fun that, again, I knew about her, but I didn't know about her. That's why I have this channel. And speaking of which, if you learned something today, and I sure hope you did, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. And while you're down there, please leave a friendly comment. I have new job stuff coming up, and so I will be trying to put these out. If not every week, it will certainly be every two weeks. So until I see you next time, don't be well behaved, you just might make history. See you next time, guys.